Good evening. Welcome to Columbia Law School. My name is Michael Gerard. I'm on the faculty here uh, teaching environmental law and energy law, and I'm director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law. I want to thank you all for coming uh, to this, the uh, David Sive Memorial Lecture in Environmental Law. This is the first of what will be a what we hope will be a long-standing lecture series in honor of one of the founders of environmental law. Uh, before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I want to introduce Daniel Rizel and invite him to say a few words about the person for whom this lecture series is named. <laughs> Dan graduated from Columbia Law School in 1961. He served as a captain in the U.S. Air Force Judge Advocates General's Office, um, and from 1967 to 73, he was with the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, becoming the uh, chief of their Environmental Protection Unit. In 1973, Dan joined the law firm that is now known as Cy Paget and Rizal, which is one of the leading environmental practices in the region. Uh, Dan has taught environmental litigation here at Columbia as a member of our adjunct faculty. Since 1982, he has co-chaired the annual uh, ALI ABA program on environmental law and many other programs. He is a vigorous advocate in environmental cases, as I can attest, having been opposite him in a number of cases. And please join me in welcoming Dan Rizal. Thank you, Michael, and uh, folks, uh, the question really is, is who was and who is David Sy? We all know, probably most of us know uh, something about David. David was the founding partner of our firm. He's often been referred to as the father of environmental law. But I'd like to tell you, I'd like to give you an insight into this person based on a personal experience. When I came back to civilian practice in 1966, I tried to figure out what it was about. And a friend of mine said, well, I know a lawyer who is working on some case involving Storm King. And I, maybe he'd talk to you. And so David Sy took an hour out of his busy day in preparing for trial in this classic case. and. Uh, Talk to me about the practice of law and uh, how you advanced in that practice. And one of the things that stuck with me was that he said, you know, I've been very fortunate in having my advocation, my interest in the environment, and uh, be part of my vocation. And, and he was talking about preparing this case to testify to inter introduce evidence about the uh, values of uh, uh, an unmarked up river, you know, uh, about the environment of the Hudson. And he sort of glowed when he talked about it. And that's probably one of the reasons why he was a great effective advocate for environmental issues. But this is, uh, I tell you this story because it's altogether fitting that we have John Cruden here uh, talking about the arc of, the in, of environmental <coughs> law and the practice of law, because he, like others, were influenced by Dave Sive. And the thing to understand about Dave was that he, like many of you, uh, used his skills that he learned in this school, in the great class of 1948, incidentally, used those skills to advance the common good. And those were, you know, he'd never had a course in environmental law or environmental risk or uh, environmental procedures. He used the general skills that of litigation and administrative law to advance the cause of the, you know, of environmental advocacy. And he did it uh, unstintingly, and he did it to the end of his career. He was a guy who was there till the end. He was a, a person who I think we would all like to be, somebody who has had an influence on the public good, using our professional skills. And for those of you who are in law school, you can draw some uh, inspiration from Dave because you are acquiring the same skills that Dave had, and you can make that difference. 
So uh, one of the people that I think had a, Dave had an effect upon was the next speaker, John Cruden. And I, and I suspect he will talk about Dave. So it's altogether fitting that we, uh, his firm has funded this annual lecture and some several ancillary programs because it is really this great school, the skills that we all acquire that will allow us all to do the public good. Thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate that. Um, before we get on the evening, I just want to, with the evening, I just want to let you know about the next major program that we are uh, putting on after this one. It is a panel on the subject, Who is Responsible for Climate Change? Implications for UN Talks, Sustainability, and Liability. It will be in this room on Wednesday, November 4th, 7 to 9 p.m., uh, you can get more information about it on our website, uh, which and also register there. That's www.columbiaclimatelaw.com. And on that site, you can also sign up for our blog and our Facebook and our Twitter accounts. So we are deeply honored this evening to be joined by John C. Cruden. After graduating from West Point, John served in the Airborne Ranger and Special Forces units in Germany and Vietnam. He took the LSATs in Saigon and then went to Santa Clara Law School uh, and University of Virginia in international relations and joined the Army's Judge Advocate General's Corps and after numerous assignments became the Chief Legislative Counsel for the Army. Then he joined the Department of Justice as Chief of the Environmental Enforcement Section from 1991 to 1995 and was then the career Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Environment and Natural Resource Division from 1995 to 2011. He took a four-year uh, detour to become, uh, from DOJ to become the President of the Environmental Law Institute. But since DOJ couldn't bear to be without him, President Obama nominated him to be the Assistant Attorney General for the Environment and Natural Resources Division, and he was confirmed after an undue delay by the U.S. Senate in December of 2014. In this position, he's the principal environmental lawyer for the United States government. He supervises about 450 lawyers and is in charge of the government's litigation over an astonishing variety of matters some obscure and some well-known, including a certain oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, a certain German automaker that has gotten into hot trouble, and a certain set of regulations on uh, power plants that is about to be besieged with more lawsuits. In addition to his government service, uh, John was the first government attorney to be elected the president of the District of Columbia Bar Association, the first government attorney to become the chair of the American Bar Association's section of Environment, Energy, and Resources. He has many other honors and accomplishments, too numerous to count, except that I'll mention that he's also a volunteer swim coach for the Special Olympics. Please join me in welcoming John Cruden. Michael, thank you for those really kind remarks. There's, uh, uh, for me personally, there's actually nothing better uh, uh, than to share the uh, platform with Dan Rizel and Mike Gerard. These are two of legendary figures in environmental law, two of the people that I uh, uh, look up to. Uh, when, uh, when Mike introduced me as having in my background the uh, chair of the American Bar Association section on the environment. He neglected to say I was following him uh, uh, at that stage. Uh, and, uh, and Dan Rizel has led for a quarter of a century uh, or more uh, the premier educational programs uh, in the United States. And so it's a, it's a treat for me uh, to be here with them. Also out in the audience, there are you know, friends uh, 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 there. And I just want to point out uh, that I have friends from the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office of the Eastern District of New York, which I think is one of the finest U.S. Attorney offices in the country. I have friends here from Department of Justice, from my role in the Environmental Law Institute. Uh, and it, it is 
and, and I would ask you all, uh, the, those of you, if you would just stand up for a second. Uh, it's, it's a real honor for me uh, personally, and I'll explain why in a second, uh, that I know that we have uh, children of, uh, of David Sive uh, in the audience. And if you would, stand up, please. Come on, please. Thank you. So what I'm going to do, uh, uh, here it is. Uh, uh, I'm going to try uh, to do some of the things that uh, Dan told you about because uh, uh, David Syed had an impact on my life and an impact on uh, what I'm going to tell you. And in various parts, I'm going to try to integrate uh, uh, some of those principles in this arc uh, that I'm going to talk about. The arc is, in fact, I'm going to start out talking a bit about how we got here environmentally. I'm going to try to integrate into that uh, what I do at the Department of Justice, what the Environment Division does. And then I want to project a bit toward the end about the future uh, uh, and some of the challenges that I see, but also some of the roles that I see of people like you uh, in the future of uh, environmental law. In, my, in your history, you will, you'll, you'll saw from uh, uh, Mike as he introduced you that at one stage, you know, before I was the chief of the environmental enforcement section, I was actually the chief legislative counsel of the Army. I had been picked uh, uh, to take that job, a rather cool job. You have 165 lawyers, you have nationwide jurisdiction, uh, and you're suing people uh, for environmental misdeeds. I get a phone call out of nowhere. I get a phone call by somebody who introduces himself as I am uh, uh, David Sive, a name I knew, I had heard of, but I had never met in my entire life. Before I make, I'm with talking with you all, I had the pleasure, uh, because Michael set it up, uh, of being with some of the people in the audience right now. We had 10 different uh, uh, law students from across, uh, uh, from here in Columbia, but their background was across the United States, all interested in environment, energy, and natural resources law. And I told them at that stage, about the benefit of mentors. I bet every single one of you, every one of you, have had somebody that you looked up to uh, in your life as a mentor. Some of them you pick, some of them they pick you. Uh, uh, David Sive called me and said these words. He said, I, John, you don't know me, but I actually know something about environmental law, They're like the greatest understatement of all time. Uh, and he said, if you're interested, I can actually help you by introducing you to other people. Uh, and, and, and telling you where uh, environmental organizations fit and, and, and other individuals. And so I'm going to be hosting a course. Come to that course, and I will do that for you. And he did that for the rest of his life. For the rest of his life, he spent time calling me and, and opening a door or encouraging me to think about something or write something. He wanted you know, he was a great writer, wrote a lot, and I'll say something about that later, uh, uh, and, and had an impact on my life. And I, and I say that uh, because I think that's a challenge for all of us, all of us. Everybody I look out in the audience, you ought to be a mentor or a mentee, uh, and, and, and just like he was, because that was something that he took on. Uh, and just like you know, Dan's story, but there are countless stories uh, of that role uh, uh, that uh, uh, he played so well. Um, so now what about environmental law? So um, if you look at the... What I have up here, I've often talked about the fact that environmental law is born out of tragedy. Uh, uh, if you think about Exxon Valdez, which gave us the Oil Pollution Act, um, or Rachel Carson, 1962 uh, uh, book, uh, you know, Silent Spring, which you know, launched the concerns about chemical uh, uh, issues. A lot of what we do and what we did in environmental law is really born out of those events, and we have all heard of them. Uh, the Santa Barbara oil spill, Valley of the Drums, Love Canal, which in many ways brought us uh, uh, Superfund. Uh, uh, but look at the other one up there. Look up there, that one, Cuyahoga. Uh, uh, the river in Ohio that's famous because in many ways it helped launch uh, what ultimately brought the Clean Water Act. Famous uh, in all of our minds that have studied history uh, uh, because the river caught on fire. Uh, so there you are, and it got front page news on the New York Times when it was happening uh, 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 of this horrible environmental event. Uh, uh, and again, it produced eventually and helped produce uh, uh, something that brought us the Clean Water Act. What is not well known, but which is true, uh, is that was not the first time Cuyahoga burned. It was the third time it burned. 
And the question I want to ask you, and the question that we'll re you know, I'll try to deal with is, why did we only react the third time? Why did we not react the first two times uh, 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 that Cuyahoga burned? What was it? What, what happened? And, and what is this Cuyahoga moment? The Cuyahoga moment is the third time when all of a sudden things occurred, uh, but it didn't, did not occur uh, 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 the first two times. Uh, and so obviously things have changed uh, since, you know, Valley of the Drums, and they've changed uh, 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 since Rachel Carson. Uh, and uh, one of the things that have changed is, in fact, uh, uh, the incredible environmental movement, which you're all familiar with. We're one of the unique disciplines uh, of the world that actually has a birthday. We actually can point to uh, uh, the day that we started. Uh, uh, and, and for some of us, certainly me, it's in our lifetime uh, uh, there. But look at my slide where I say uh, 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 Earth Day, which again launches. Uh, uh, 20 million people shocked everybody at that stage, shocked everybody in you know, April 1970 that we had that many people. And now it's international. Earth Day is international. There's an NGO that handles uh, uh, international. I have told others uh, that environmental law in many ways is unique in this regard. Uh, uh, the United States of America did not actually invent much law. Uh, uh, we all know that law came to us in a circuitous fashion through Greeks and Romans and English men and women uh, uh, to what we think of as the body of law that we study right now. Uh, um, but we did, in fact, invent environmental law. Uh, uh, not only did we invent it, well, once we were done, we've exported it. Uh, uh, there's not many countries in the, in the world right now that do not have something like uh, the National Environmental Policy Act, that do not have something like Clean Water Act permits or air permits, who do not care about safe drinking, uh, in some places, like Europe and uh, chemical examination, they're actually ahead of us. Uh, uh, but my point is uh, uh, there uh, that those tragedies that we were told you about uh, uh, did, in fact, bring, bring eventually, bring people interested. Uh, and before there was legislation, there was people interested. That's how it worked, uh, and that's how I think it works in the future. So out of this you know, great happening, the 20 million people uh, uh, there. Now comes the body of law and the uh, apparatus uh, uh, that we now have uh, that governs us. This is audience participation, just for a second. Who, which president did the Environmental Protection Agency? By executive order. Now, remember, not by a legislation, by executive order. What president? Uh, was NEPA and the Council of Environmental Council, uh, Equality created under Nixon, you know? Uh, uh, and so all of this is happening uh, in, in a way that is almost breathtaking. The statutory avalanche uh, uh, that happens uh, is, in fact, uh, 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 breathtaking. Everything that we think of now as the body of environmental law has their beginnings. Uh, uh, in the, during in a very active time. And by the way, if you look at the vote counts uh, uh, at that particular time, uh, for all of those, pick CERCLA, which is an incredible statute, or pick CERCLA 1986 when Reagan signed uh, CERA uh, uh, there. Those are overwhelming vote counts of a bipartisan nature, Republicans and Democrats looking and saying, we want our grandchildren and our children to be healthy. Um, and, and that is important. Even now polling, right now, if you poll uh, where you put environmental concerns in the United States, uh, uh, environmental issues are always in the top 10, very often in the top five. That has not changed. So now we're, we have the statutes, we have Earth Day, we have things uh, uh, that are in fact uh, uh, happening uh, and uh, uh, should be happening. Um, but the infrastructure is not completely there. Uh, and, and, and now we need committed men and women uh, to do things uh, that will, in fact, uh, um, uh, get that infrastructure going. One of the things, when Michael told you for, for four years I was president of the Environmental Law Institute, one of the things I was able to do, and, and really uh, uh, fun for me, uh, is that we looked at who were the uh, parents, if you will, uh, of the environmental law movement as we have today. Who were those people in the 1960s, 1970s, uh, who in fact built uh, the structure uh, that we enjoy uh, uh, today? Uh, and so 
uh, it would not surprise you that the very first one that I did, I did others uh, out there, but the very first one that I did uh, was uh, 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 David Sive uh, for a number of reasons. I have uh, an oral history. I'm only going to show you five minutes uh, of the oral history, but listen carefully uh, uh, because it is these words by a very, very humble man who has, in fact, uh, 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 created or inspired or, or mobilized our profession today. Uh, I'll listen to uh, 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 what he has to say, and I'll build on that. Oops. The organizations which I founded were NRDC, Friends of the Earth, and I, with others, founded ELI, and Environmental Advocates of New York State, which used to be called the Environmental Planning Lobby. They're not only important, but absolutely indispensable, because there was nobody else who had the desire and the talent and the resources to do it. And those resources included the dedication of people like myself who since their early childhood were great outdoor lovers and, and wilderness lovers. In fact, virtually all of the early cases were about the preservation of an area of scenic beauty. Scenic Hudson, the Hudson River Expressway, Overland Park, the case neighbors I, that we call involving the interstate in Texas and others which were the effort, part of the effort to protect scenic beauty, particularly wilderness areas. So I brought this, I think, the first suit against under NEPA in around January 8th or 9th. NEPA became effective on January 1st. And I decided to look into the legislative history of NEPA. Well, I went to Washington to see Timothy Atkinson, who had just been moved from the legal office of the World Bank to be the first general counsel of CEQ. I interviewed him and he asked me what I would think of the creation of a legal advisory committee, which he regarded as important because so few lawyers knew of anything of environmental law. But we did. And the work in that committee was one of the most interesting and fruitful. Its most important work dealt with the standing issue. The great national debate at that time was over standing in court for environmental groups and others. And that issue dominated the early meetings of the committee. Well, the debate came to a climax at a meeting where I wrote out and gave to Mike Sima a resolution stating in substance that uh, and citizen suits and citizens standing in court are an important act of, uh, important aspect of the enforcement and uh, progress of environmental law. So by a narrow margin, we enacted that resolution. It was sent to Russell Train, who was the first head of CEQ, and then sent by him to the congressional committees and other groups then considering the Clean Air Act. Well, on December of 70, the Clean Air Act with a uh, citizen suit section was enacted. And that 
the promotion of the cause of the principle of citizenship was featured by this resolution and the citizenship section became a part of the Water Act in 72, the Endangered Species Act in 73, and others. He says at the beginning, and there's some people here who have worked there or now, uh, and John Adams has written about this in his book uh, that David uh, uh, helped create, uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, uh, the organization that I uh, uh, led, the Environmental Law Institute. Um, what he doesn't tell you is that he personally litigated and established uh, 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 much of the standing law that we still use, which is how actually people get in, into court. Um, but the last part uh, is so unique in, in world uh, a law, uh, our provisions in air and water, what we take as commonplace that citizens have a right to bring a lawsuit and can enforce statutes and can sue the government as they do me regularly. Uh, 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 there, that that is part of our uh, of the rights is really extraordinary in the world. Uh, and we have people to thank like David Sive, who were there at the ground floor, there at the very beginning of that, uh, who thought uh, uh, that the citizen role was actually important, important enough to be heard, and then it got integrated into things like uh, 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 water and air. So, you know, we start with, you know, the Russell Train, our first head of CEQ, later becomes the administrator of EPA. But things are now, you know, look, this is what uh, 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 these achievements. Uh, uh, Pew went out and did a survey. They, they did like the top 100 things of all time that have occurred. And look, environmental things are clearly in the top three. And the other ones, in fact, registered as gigantic accomplishments. Uh, and so air, water, uh, uh, land, those things that we treasure, those things that are the foundations of our environmental practice, they're better. They're absolutely better uh, uh, than they were. Look uh, uh, here. This is Cuyahoga today. You saw the picture of Cuyahoga burning. Now this is Cuyahoga today uh, uh, there. So it is in fact improved for sure. It has improved uh, 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 there. Um, but my point, I think, and what I will try to now address more uh, is that uh, the fact that we have, in fact, improved, that we've gotten better, that we have a statutory uh, process that picks up things like the ideals and the challenges that David Sive endorsed does not mean that we're there. There's more to do yet. What you see right now is what I saw uh, uh, in April 2010 uh, when the Coast Guard took me out uh, to look at the burning rig uh, called Deepwater Horizon. That's what that is, and I'll come back uh, uh, to that. What I want to try to now bring you into the world that I live in. I want to bring you into the world of the Environmental Natural Resources Division, one of the litigating divisions of the Department of Justice, uh, uh, partnering, by the way, with uh, uh, wonderful U.S. attorneys like here. We have representatives from Eastern District and, and try to tell you how that fits, but also try to show you how that fits in the context of the history and this arc of environmental and natural resources law uh, as it's progressed uh, uh, and much of it. Uh, uh, during our lifetime. Michael told you it's a relatively big group. We have 650 people now. It's a little bit bigger than my slide. We're right around 450 uh, 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 lawyers practicing exclusively uh, uh, environment, energy, natural resources law. That's uh, all, all that we do. And actually Native American issues uh, 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 to the extent that they are also uh, natural resource driven uh, uh, there uh, and land driven. So that's actually a unique part and, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to uh, uh, that. Here you see uh, up here, this is, you, it, it, uh, I'm gonna, you don't have to, just look at the pie charts, don't look at any of the names, hard to read it anyway, because I'm going to tell you what it, what's there. Um, and you'll see we have, at any given stage, it goes up or down, you know, somewhere between five to 7,000 cases that we have responsibility for. Don't worry, it's not like they're all active at the same time. They're not uh, 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 there, but it just gives you some idea uh, uh, of, uh, of what we have as uh, uh, collective responsibility. About half of what we do uh, is offensive. So we're bringing cases uh, uh, criminally. We're bringing criminal cases, you know, roughly about 100 a year. Uh, and we're bringing civil cases uh, uh, there. So today, uh, uh, if you go back and you access uh, ours, uh, we did a case called Lumber Liquidator uh, uh, today. Uh, those of you who follow 60 Minutes, uh, this was a 60 Minutes company because of formaldehyde in wood. Uh, that's not this case. 
Uh, this case is a Lacey Act case. It's a case that actually allows us uh, to prosecute uh, things like illegal wildlife trafficking, which is a huge area, a billion dollar uh, industry, uh, and this one is for wood. The Lacey Act was amended, so if you actually bring in protected wood into the country, uh, it's a violation. This wood actually came from uh, Russia, uh, uh, and it was, uh, uh, they lied about it. They lied about it, saying it really came from Germany. Germany has a really pretty good, substantial uh, forestry system. Russia, not surprisingly, does not. Um, but the wood coming in was not only illegal, it was also the habitat uh, for the Siberian uh, uh, tiger and the snow leopard, two of the most endangered creatures in the world, uh, in the, uh, the tiger that is less than 400 and, and way less than that of, of the leopards. So it had series uh, of wrong things associated with it, but that's a criminal case that we just announced uh, today. It's an example of an offensive case that we bring, but about half is defensive. Uh, and so we're sued frequently for either misdeeds or alleged misdeeds, but we're also sued for things like EPA regulations uh, uh, there. So that is a defensive suit, uh, 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 and we have a defensive section that does that, and I'll show you in a second uh, uh, where that fits into our history and, and where it now, uh, how we actually handle that uh, logistically. So again, it's about half offensive, about half defensive. On the right side, it's really just federal agencies that we work with. We work with all of them uh, uh, because of the Natural Environmental Policy Act. You know, major federal action, significantly affecting the quality of the human environment, uh, requires study, requires analysis, uh, and if that's not done correctly, if that's not done in the right sequence, uh, oh, we see lawsuits. Frequently, those lawsuits are connected with some other statute uh, uh, there, but we have, we have Clearly, and you would expect this, uh, uh, we have agencies that we're dealing with all the time. We're dealing with every single day, uh, and you would expect the Environmental Protection Agency, of course, uh, but the Department of Interior. The Department of Interior, uh, which is responsible for roughly, you know, 20% of the land mass of the United States between Bureau of Land, Ma uh, Bureau of land Management and the National Park Service. Uh, and so uh, they are a, a, a huge client for us all the alternative energy issues, but we have grazing disputes, we have water disputes uh, uh, there, uh, all of which come into that umbrella uh, of Department of Interior. Department of Defense, largely because of Corps of Engineers. Uh, uh, the Department of Commerce, largely because of NOAA, National Oceanic Administration. Uh, and then Department of Agriculture, be because? Department of Agriculture, because? Forest Service, uh, also a huge landowner. Uh, 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 there. So those are the major agencies that you'll, that we are seeing, and we're seeing them all the time uh, uh, there. I don't want, I'm not, you know, by the way, who in the world would ever want to see a, an organizational chart during a, a lecture like this? Uh, 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 there, me too. Uh, uh, and that's not why it's up there. It's up there just to identify it, because I actually want to show you the arc. I want to try to marry up a little bit uh, what I was telling you about now, Earth Day and, and how that moved forward uh, with the history of the uh, uh, Environment Division. Uh, so the Environment Division established over 100 years ago, 1909. Uh, we're coming up to our birthday. Our birthday's in November 23rd. Uh, uh, it's established as the Public Lands Division. Uh, now this is like President Roosevelt, great conservationist, Republican, but a great conservationist. Uh, and so it is established because of all the legal issues associated with two things the public land, national parks, and other parts, the things that are owned, and Native American issues. So from the very beginning of our history, we have conservation issues, we have natural resource issues, but we also have Native American issues. And all you all know uh, that those are unique trust responsibilities that we have, uh, and, and that it continues today. A lot of our Native American litigation deals with water as, as resources or land uh, uh, issues. Right now, we've actually sued the state of Washington uh, over taxation. The Tulalip tribe, which is just about 30 miles out of Seattle, uh, uh, worked diligently to establish their own tribal entity uh, and to create things that would attract people to come to the tribe uh, uh, for tourism and other things. They got no outside help uh, for that. They did it themselves, and now they're running it themselves. They get no assistance for fire, uh, for police, for any other service by the uh, outlying community but what they do get is taxed. Uh, they're being taxed, and because of uh, laws, they cannot then gain any taxation benefit of all of the various uh, uh, corporate and business entities on their tribe. So we've sued uh, the state uh, uh, in, in supporting the tribe, uh, uh, trying to make that fair. 
uh, so that, in fact, the, the tribe can get some of the money uh, that would otherwise, that's otherwise now going to the state. Uh, and so we have other responsibilities, but from the very beginning, public lands uh, and uh, a tribe. Then over World War II erupts, uh, and there's a crying need for military bases and, and things of that nature. Later, uh, we start escalating national parks, uh, and so we acquired land, even today. Uh, even today, north of uh, uh, Everglades to like, east of Big Cypress National Park, we are acquiring land, uh, which you attempt to buy, but if you can't, you can actually uh, take it. Uh, the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution allows you to take land if you pay for it. And so we have trials. We have trials of the fair market value uh, uh, of land. But that was huge, huge in World War II. That was by far our biggest section. Now it's a, one of our smaller sections, but it clearly uh, 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 still happens. Then, in the, then the 70s erupt. Remember all the major statutes that you studied, all the ones that we're talking about. We think of them as media statutes, air, land, and water. Uh, we do the same thing. We create those sections uh, that are going to handle those statutes. So we create what is now in our environmental enforcement section, which is all civil, uh, and environmental crime section, which is, as you would guess, all criminal, and the environmental defense section, which again represents agencies who are themselves sued, but they can be sued for environmentally productive things. Uh, permits, so we regularly get sued over permitting uh, uh, or regulations where we're representing uh, uh, those agencies uh, in that regard. And then there's one missing. Uh, there's one missing that I haven't mentioned other than a pellet, which does what you think, uh, and that is uh, um, the pit bull of environmental statutes. Same era, 1970s, not a pollution statute. Uh, uh, worried about uh, uh, having species alive for our grandkids, it would be. Endangered Species Act. So we have a wildlife section, and now we've combined marine resources because it raises some of the issues, uh, same as uh, ESA, largely Marine Mammal Protection a Act. Uh, and so we have one section doing exclusively uh, of those areas. Um, but, but again, you can see now uh, that that history of what we're doing mirrors, again, the history and the trajectory, the arc, of, according to my speech, uh, of environment and natural resources law in general. So we're creating those groups of people to handle those things that are coming out of the statutes that have been enacted. Here, up here, are the five priorities that I've established for uh, uh, the division. That's the one thing I do get to do. I get to be, as the Assistant Attorney General, uh, uh, I get, in fact, uh, uh, not, not to adjust cases, uh, because remember, half what we do is getting sued, and, uh, but in fact, to adjust priorities. Uh, and so you'll see here the things that I cared about, uh, and so now uh, uh, we've passed this out. So it would not surprise you, knowing my background, that environmental enforcement is, is important to me, environmental justice, wildlife trafficking, protecting the public fisc, uh, 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 meaning that we're in fact trying in fact uh, 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 to make sure that we're, we're very conscious of money issues and what the federal government would have to pay uh, in lawsuits. All of those things are relevant to us and all of those five goals actually uh, 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 reflect uh, the 10 elements and what the 10 elements do uh, of, uh, of the Department of Justice. So, Hold these thoughts because now we're going to do stuff. Now we're going to do cases for a second uh, uh, there and, and try to illustrate uh, uh, with uh, uh, three different things uh, uh, what, how we do that, how this fits, how this works into the arc uh, of environmental law. So April 2010, uh, uh, many of you saw that 87 days, uh, uh, you're glued to the underwater cam uh, that's showing oil spitting out of the uh, deep water horizon. It ultimately resulted in an oil slick uh, that was about the size of the state of Virginia, uh, affecting uh, the entirety of the five Gulf states. Uh, the beach closures uh, were there, and the impacted oil uh, that landed on the beach was a distance of about from here, right here in Columbia Law School, uh, to New Orleans. It was about that distance uh, uh, there. It closed fisheries all during that time period. It closed all of the beaches uh, uh, during that time period. People got sick. Uh, uh, people went to doctors over all that. And it was an economic uh, 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 disaster uh, for a fragile economic area uh, 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 of the Gulf. So that is the uh, what we saw uh, in uh, uh, Deepwater Horizon. Um, between then and 2010, uh, and now here in 2015, we're not exactly done, uh, but as of October the 5th, 
we've uh, uh, finished all but one aspect of, of one defendant, and, and we did the big one of uh, 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 BP. Now, what do you want to do in these circumstances? So now you're thinking about, uh, uh, you know, David Sive, and you're thinking about how, in fact, uh, uh, do we go back and, and, and try to reach back and, and recalculate and figure out how that ecosystem was harmed, and if you can get some money, what are you going to do with the money uh, 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 there? And those are actually very sophisticated questions in an ecosystem like uh, the Gulf, which has been harmed over the years and has many other problems associated with it, not just what we saw uh, in uh, uh, Deepwater Horizon. So there was a number of lawsuits that were brought, many private lawsuits. Uh, 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 interestingly, in Exxon Valdez, which I also uh, uh, did, uh, uh, in Exxon Valdez, we resolved on the federal side in two years, but then the private claims took 20 years. Uh, to resolve. Here's the flip. Uh, here in uh, Deepwater Horizon, they resolved the private claims in about three years uh, uh, there, but we did not resolve yet. The, it, we didn't, had not resolved the federal claims at that stage. Criminal went first, and then the big ones uh, uh, were the civil claims. And, and, and here, in a nutshell, is what we announced uh, uh, just a, a, a week and a half ago. Uh, we announced three different components uh, of our settlement with BP, which when it was announced, was announced as the largest settlement uh, with a single defendant in the history of the United States. So not just environmental. Exxon Valdez was, by the way, the biggest environmental uh, settlement when we did that in 1991. It was collectively $1 billion. Uh, uh, Deepwater Horizon was collectively BP, just a civil part, uh, uh, $20.8 billion. Um, three components. Uh, component number one, as you would expect, is a penalty. Uh, so the Clean Water Act gives you penalty authority uh, without question. It had an enormous impact uh, of there. Uh, and the penalty was $5.5 billion, which by itself uh, is the highest penalty uh, uh, ever. But a unique statute. Uh, out of Exxon Valdez uh, came the Oil Pollution Act. It was the Oil Pollution Act that was used to prosecute uh, uh, the case of uh, Deepwater Horizon. But out of this uh, uh, tragedy uh, came something called the Restore Act. You probably know that the penalties that we recover go back into the federal treasury. They do not go back into the environment. Penalties go to the federal treasury, except, except uh, uh, Restore Act. Uh, so 80% of those $5.5 billion will go back into restoring the Gulf. There's a council already set up. Uh, it's federal uh, and state, uh, and it's already in action. They're already reviewing over 100 projects right now to advance the Gulf. That's, that's the first bucket, if you will, of money. The second bucket of money is natural resource damage money. A very unique statute, uh, not just the Oil Pollution Act, it's in others, uh, it's used a lot. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Circulus Superfund know a, a lot of those are natural resource damages. So the concept there is unique in federal uh, environmental law uh, uh, because the re it's not a penalty. And, and, and every dollar you recover can only be used to restore, replace, or acquire equivalent resources. That's all you can do with that money. Uh, uh, and this amount, which is $8.7 billion, uh, that was a natural resource damage recovery. The whole concept is, the whole concept is, it's going to be used to restore the Gulf to where it would have been, but for the polluting event. That's the concept. So you establish kind of a baseline of where it was, and there was the study of that by the federal agencies and state agencies and NGOs is astronomical. Uh, uh, there are not thousands, there's hundreds of thousands of sampling events. Uh, 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 there, there are mortuary work with birds and, and other, other marine mammals to try, to try to figure out what the harm was. And based on that calculation of harm, uh, 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 then you estimate uh, uh, what it's gonna take financially to restore the, uh, the Gulf. And you're actually thinking ahead to what kind of pro projects you need. Uh, uh, so I actually guarantee you part of the projects will be restoring wetland off the Gulf of Louisiana. Uh, uh, because that's what you lost. You lost wetland, which has an effect uh, not just on habitat, but also has an effect on floods, Katrina, and elsewhere. But anyway, that second part that we announced was that pot of money, but simultaneously uh, a draft restoration plan over 1,400 pages, signed by all five federal agencies that were involved, signed by all five states, which is all designed to say, if you have that amount of money, biggest you've ever had, this is how we're going to use it. Uh, uh, and, and that's all for public comment. I'll come back to that. Then that's second bucket. The third bucket is entirely economic. The first time this has ever been done under the Oil Pollution Act, uh, uh, and this was not me. Uh, these were the five Gulf states who lost economic 
money. The Oil Pollution Act allows you to recover that if, in fact, lost taxes and all those things. And remember I told you they basically shut down uh, uh, the fishing industry, shut down uh, the entirety of their tourist industry during those 87 days. Uh, and so the five Gulf states sued BP for economic damages, as did over 400 counties and parishes. Uh, the settlement for the states is $4.9 billion. Uh, the settlement for the uh, counties and parishes adds up to about a billion. So collectively, collectively, uh, $20.8 billion. But remember, remember, and this is unique, this is actually, you know, citizen suits are unique, uh, but the role of citizens in environmental law is absolutely uh, unique. Uh, everything I just told you, except the economic case, uh, goes out for public comment. Goes out for public comment and there will be eight public hearings. Public hearings on the environmental impact statement that's uh, associated with this, public hearings on the consent decree, uh, the restoration plan and where the money is going to go. Uh, uh, and, and, and this settlement will not be final, absolutely will not be final, until all that public comment is in, and then you go to the judge, the judge is Barbier, who was picked by the MDL panel, good judge, uh, uh, and then you go to the judge and say, I want to change because of things I, I learned, or I don't want to change, uh, uh, I have a deal, and I want you to, quote, enter the consent decree. Once you enter the consent decree, it's done, by the way, it's an order of the court then, so if BP were to, in fact, not follow it, 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 it we could actually seek contempt of court. Uh, uh, BP in London guarantees the payments. Uh, uh, there was a previous cl criminal plea and there's a previous uh, debarment that's included in this deal, so it's a very comprehensive deal. But I actually want to hold you, because a lot of press in terms of how much money, because it's so huge. Uh, the Washington Post called it a jaw-dropping number. But, but more importantly, back to David, more importantly, when we're done, the public's still involved, the public still has a role, uh, and, and you can write comments on a postcard. You don't need a lawyer, you can just do it, and every single comment will actually go to the court. Uh, and so that is an example of the 50% of what we do in the Environment Division on the civil side of bringing an enforcement uh, uh, action. Uh, here is uh, 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 power plants. Uh, and so tomorrow, at least it's been reported in the news tomorrow, uh, uh, the uh, uh, two rules uh, that proposed by EPA uh, uh, called the Clean Power Plan, directed by the President, will go into uh, uh, the Federal Register. The significance of that uh, uh, is that by statute, once you go into the Federal Register, uh, uh, you can sue. It will probably happen. Uh, uh, there will probably be multiple lawsuits uh, uh, filed to challenge the legality uh, uh, of the clean power plant because it, it's very far reaching, it's very significant, and it's all designed to reduce uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, and meet the goal that the United States has established uh, of being about a third less by uh, uh, 2030. Um, um, by the way, why would you go after power plants? Uh, it's a little bit like, who was the, the, the bank robber that they asked, why do, why, do, why do you steal money from banks? Who was that guy? Willie Sutton, why do you steal money from banks? And Willie Sutton was, well, that's where the money is. It's a little bit like that for power plants. You know, why would you go after them significantly and, and try to get your greenhouse gas reductions there? Because, in fact, that's where a lot of the uh, uh, greenhouse gas uh, uh, is today. Uh, um, we've already had four challenges uh, uh, even before this time. So even though I told you uh, that it isn't really right for challenge, it goes into the Federal Register, uh, there, there's so much interest uh, uh, about all of this that, that we've actually uh, litigated it four times already uh, uh, there. All in the D.C. Circuit, well actually D.C. Circuit in Oklahoma. Uh, um, there's a unique provision of the statute that says uh, uh, Clean Air Act uh, statutes uh, can only be litigated in the D.C. Circuit. Uh, uh, notwithstanding that, again, there was uh, uh, lawsuits apart from that. But the, the lawsuits that came before the D.C. Circuit, uh, we were able to defend that it's just premature. Uh, it doesn't mean that there aren't good arguments there. It just means it's premature. You ought not challenge it uh, until uh, uh, it goes into the Federal Register. And then, and then it starts a 60-day process. You have a 60-day process by which you can move to stay, uh, uh, or you can file a petition for review uh, of, for it, um, or you can ask, go back administratively to EPA and, and give them a petition to reconsider uh, the rule. All of those things are possible. Frankly, it's fairly likely that all of those uh, uh, will occur. Uh, and then after that, then the, then the whole process uh, goes forward. As you have seen already, 
You saw that uh, in the beginning of this administration uh, when EPA gave their so-called endangerment finding uh, uh, that in fact carbon dioxide was harmful to the health. Uh, and that went through the litigation process. Uh, it went through a litigation process for both mobile sources, sources that move, uh, and stationary sources. Some of that went to the Supreme Court. You saw that process. It came out of the D.C. Circuit and then ultimately uh, uh, went to the Supreme Court. We're starting that process anew uh, uh, right now, but they're very significant. Uh, uh, and if successful, uh, will in fact have a dramatic effect uh, uh, lowering uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, in the United States. Um, so stay tuned. Watch tomorrow. See what happens uh, uh, there. Uh, this is another. Uh, this is not, you know, I put Hudson, I use Hudson River as an example just because it's fun because we did Hudson River case too, but, and General Electric is about done with their dredging, but that's not why I have Hudson up there. Uh, 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 I really have it there because uh, of another rule uh, that's under uh, challenge right now, which we call Waters of the United States. Um, and this whole, it's a whole question uh, uh, that has really been in doubt uh, since the Supreme Court decided uh, uh, some years ago, a case called Rapanos, where they were unable to reach a majority decision. It was a, a decision that has four, one, four. Uh, you know, so you have four, not, a, not a, you know, a plurality. And then right in the middle, audience participation, who would be the one judge right in the middle? Kennedy, Kennedy yes, uh, 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 there. Uh, and then uh, 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 dissenters. And it really created a huge area of uncertainty uh, uh, trying to figure out where water is covered by the Clean Water Act, uh, and therefore you need permits, so, or you need to have to go to the Corps of Engineers when you think it might be a wetland or not. Uh, a, a huge area, a lot of litigation there. Virtually every court of appeals has tried to deal with what does Rapanos mean? Uh, does a decision written by four justices, led by Justice Scalia, does that control? Only had four votes. What about Kennedy? Kennedy, the dissent says uh, we could live with Kennedy. What does that mean? Uh, 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 there because, uh, and, and courts are all over the place uh, on uh, what that is, but many have always said what you really need is a rule. You really need a rule to straighten that out. EPA and the Corps of Engineers come together and they did the rule uh, 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 there. So far so good, right? Remember what I told you about the Clean Air Act, the, that uh, uh, rules of nationwide jurisdiction go exclusively in the D.C. Circuit? That's actually not true in the Clean Water Act, or at least it's not decided. We're litigating that right now. Uh, and so after that rule was promulgated, I'll get these numbers a little bit wrong, but you get the point. Uh, uh, Twelve district courts, six courts of appeals, uh, uh, petition, or petitions or lawsuits filed there. Uh, uh, and the court of appeals on their own, God bless them, uh, uh, they centered it in the Sixth Circuit. And so we're litigating right now in the Sixth Circuit on behalf of all the courts of appeals that did not happen in the district court. Uh, and so we're now seeking uh, uh, them to stay that while we wait and see what happens to the Sixth Circuit but it's fully briefed in the Eighth Circuit and the Eleventh Circuit. Uh, right now, pending their decision uh, as to whether or not they have jurisdiction, the Sixth Circuit has stayed the rule. Uh, uh, and so, and then tomorrow, tomorrow we'll file a brief uh, uh, which we will say, uh, this is a preview of coming attractions, where we say we think the Sixth Circuit actually does have jurisdiction, uh, and Courts of Appeals does have jurisdiction, but that's not decided. It's absolutely uh, uh, not decided. And that's before we get to the merits. That's before we get to the merits uh, of what, what waters are in or out, uh, enormously uh, important uh, uh, in the United States, particularly when we're facing huge droughts in California uh, and we're facing water events all across the United States. Uh, and, and also because every one of us, I don't care which side of that fence you might be on, every one of us wants good drinkable water, good swimmable water. Those are goals that were embedded in the Clean Water Act uh, uh, there. But it is a controversial rule because it intersects with agricultural concerns uh, uh, that in fact, uh, some of this regulation could affect some of their land, uh, and so it, that's part of the uh, uh, controversy. Uh, uh, so that was my third. Remember, I started out uh, uh, with you with Deepwater Horizon uh, as an affirmative case. The last two that I've attempted to just alert you to uh, was the President's Clean Power Plan, really was the President's uh, uh, plan. The President actually even directed under the Clean Power Plan what statute uh, I want you to use. I want you to use Clean Air Act 111D uh, uh, there, and that's what EPA did. And then here is Waters of the United States, a jurisdictional rule uh, uh, that EPA has uh, uh, come up with. These, no matter how they come out, no matter how they uh, uh, end up at the time, uh, are still part of that arc of history, are still part of those things that David Stive brought to us, because we're now still working a little bit more sophisticated 
uh, on air issues, on water issues, on land issues. We're still looking at what the health of, uh, of all of us. Never overlook the fact that it's not just environment, it's environment and health. That's what our statutory base is. It's involving citizens uh, 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 there. Uh, and the one other thing that David Sive said famously, he said it several different times, he said environmental law is a unique part uh, of all of our disciplines because of the enormous effect that litigation has had on it. And that's really true. Uh, uh, the most cited case in the nation uh, right now, way more than Marbury versus Madison, is an environmental case called Chevron uh, 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 there. Uh, and so uh, the litigation, in fact, has had a gigantic impact. Uh, and these cases right here are, are just the latest example. The latest example uh, of how our discipline, how our body of law has been shaped by citizens, has been shaped by environmental groups, have been shaped by people like you uh, uh, there, uh, but has been uh, uh, shaped by this evolving notion uh, that allows all of us uh, uh, to, in fact, uh, uh, be part of that process. Um, so with that in mind, I want to turn just a little bit uh, uh, to uh, uh, my own thoughts about the future. Um, obviously, I am leaving, you know, this morning, uh, 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 Washington, D.C. Uh, that's almost a laugh line right now, uh, giving all the things that are happening. Uh, we have not had any major statutes, uh, probably um, since the Clean Air Act Amendments of uh, 1990. Uh, and uh, uh, some of us think that other statutes like Tosca reform should actually happen, and even those are much slower than we expect. Uh, and so uh, what does that mean? What does that mean? Uh, uh, that in fact uh, the building blocks of what we've been talking about here during this presentation, the building blocks uh, uh, of uh, statutes uh, for like the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, or Resource Conservation Recovery Act, building blocks that form our basis, what happens now uh, that those things have not been updated, have not changed uh, 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 there. I believe uh, that what we saw in the 70s, uh, I believe that that 20 million people that showed up for Earth Day in 1970 are, are still here. Uh, uh, they're still here. This audience is a good example of, uh, of that. Uh, and, but the progress in the future uh, uh, may well be different. Uh, and the progress in the future, in fact, here are the things that I thought about uh, uh, that will affect our future. And then I'm going to comment on just a, a few of them. Um, but I do believe uh, uh, that uh, uh, you are important in that process, um, and so that every one of us has that individual responsibility uh, to, in fact, understand uh, of those sorts of issues and participate uh, uh, in those issues. Uh, there is not only a place for young people, there is actually a responsibility uh, 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 for young people. Uh, and, and by that I mean a lot of environmental things, actually a lot of people came together in the 70s and 80s, uh, and, and those people are now passing. Uh, uh, David Sive's passing uh, creates uh, a, a real need uh, uh, for some of you to be the next David Sive uh, uh, that are there. So you're carrying that baton, you're carrying on uh, uh, those things that he started uh, uh, there. Why? Why is it? Now let's go back to just for a second uh, uh, my Cuyahoga moment, because uh, I asked you the question in the beginning, remember I told you that was the third time the fire had started. Why did it happen? Why did we react? Why did we do things the third time and not the first two times? And I really do think that's, you know, that's leadership. But I don't mean leadership necessarily at the presidential uh, uh, level because that's not how it happened. Uh, that's not how it happened in the 70s and it's not how it's going to happen in the future. When I say leadership, I actually mean small groups, people like you all, people that are concerned, people that are doing things, people that see the Cuyahoga moment and take advantage of it uh, to actually advance the environment. Uh, uh, I don't know what the next Cuyahoga moment will be, but there will be. I, I don't know what it will be. What I do know uh, is that when I talk about environmental law being born out of tragedy, when I talk about Exxon Valdez or, uh, uh, or the DDT uh, uh, scare, there were people there that were leaders that were able to take advantage of that and actually advance environment when that happened. So that's what I'm thinking about uh, uh, there uh, when I'm talking about uh, leadership matters. And that's what I'm thinking about for the next Cuyahoga moment, because I think that's a responsibility uh, uh, for all of us. I've said along uh, uh, there that uh, uh, state and local uh, issues, there's an enormous amount of innovation going on, uh, and there's an enormous amount of caring uh, going on. 
uh, and they're watching polluting events and it should be that way. Uh, if you look at what I'm doing at the Department of Justice, I'm very proud of our enforcement record, uh, but we're small. We're small compared to all of the enforcement actions that are going on, particularly at state and local government, and that should be that way. People that are closest to the polluting event uh, uh, should care uh, uh, the most. EPA is doing something which I applaud, uh, uh, and we're now very much involved in it, that they call next generation enforcement. Uh, uh, looking at technology, the next on my list, looking at things that in fact will advance. Uh, right now on Earth Day, I announced a, a, a case that we did with Noble Energy. It's a big series of those huge, huge uh, uh, holding tanks. Uh, 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 that, and this one was uh, uh, condensate uh, out of natural gas exploration right outside of uh, uh, Denver. Uh, and what EPA was able to do was a, if you look, if you, we were driving by, and some of you may, may have driven by uh, these noble plants, it, it looks pristine. It just looks like wonderful little, uh, uh, you know, holding areas uh, there. But if you have infrared camera uh, uh, and you look at it, you actually see uh, VOC, volatile organic compounds, emitting from uh, these uh, uh, tanks. They brought that to the attention of Noble. Noble said, we will fix that. We will use that technology and we will advertise it to others uh, uh, there. So technology, as we're seeing, every one of you right now uh, 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 have your own phone in our lifetime. Uh, uh, people will be driving by and, and doing air emissions and water sampling and then radioing that back. Uh, uh, that's going to be happening. So, but how to make that work, how to use that effectively is a next challenge for us, but it's looking to uh, uh, the future. I want to just say uh, 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 there, this is Climate March. Uh, uh, right now, uh, back to my uh, uh, point uh, uh, that, in fact, uh, this is a bottom-up uh, analysis. Uh, uh, this is, in fact, people doing things together. Uh, that's what matters. That's what happens. This is climate. Climate now has risen. Uh, 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 the people, the number of people who think climate is real and important, uh, those numbers are uh, going up, perhaps, perhaps because uh, the Pope visited uh, us. I'm not quite sure. Uh, maybe because they're looking at the 97% of the scientists who are in agreement that that's a real problem. I'm not sure. Uh, um, what I do think, though, is that that's the public going more aware, becoming more educated, uh, and then uh, uh, interested, interested in doing things. Uh, here at Columbia Law School, a great center led by Mike Gerard, uh, making this happen. But I do not want uh, at all uh, to uh, uh, pass by what I've already said once, and, and that is uh, that uh, 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 young people matter. Uh, two nights ago, um, I was uh, at the dinner of the Environmental Law Institute. We actually give uh, uh, an annual award. I'm obviously not the president. We have a new president, the former general counsel of EPA uh, named Scott Fulton. The award was given to Henry Diamond, who was here when uh, there was a governor Rockefeller, and he was the head of the Department of Environmental Conservation, so he's a great conservationist. But what I did then, what I did, they gave me, which was kind of fun, uh, uh, they gave me a baton. Uh, when I was in high school in college, I ran track and I was on the relay team. By the way, I was the third on the relay team. That's the slowest one. Uh, and you're giving it to uh, the fastest runner. The, the, the fourth, the anchor leg is always the fastest runner. Uh, uh, and I felt a little bit like that because I really liked the new president of ELI that I was passing the baton. And I did that publicly in front of 700 people to Scott Fulton as the new president of uh, uh, ELI. But I think many of us uh, uh, think uh, that David Sive, uh, uh, God bless him, uh, had that baton in his hand for so many years, and now he's passing it on to each and every one of us. He's passing that baton to us, uh, saying, I did what I could. I moved enormously uh, uh, environmental issues during my lifetime. Now you take the baton, it's your turn. Uh, and, and when you're done, you're going to be passing it to your children and your grandchildren, and, and, and hopefully uh, you'll be passing it just a little bit better world uh, uh, than what we got. Uh, uh, so um, I told you about um, uh, a, a bit about uh, uh, that arc that I described. Uh, I told you a little bit about what the Environment Division does, my own thoughts about uh, 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 the future. Um, there's another arc. Uh, when I need solace uh, or I need comfort around uh, in Washington, uh, D.C., which is full of uh, monuments, there's no better place that sits right along the water. It has a great towering figure uh, of Martin Luther King. 
uh, uh, than to sit there uh, and to uh, uh, reflect. He had another arc uh, that he is famous for saying, and that is that the arc of the moral universe is long, uh, but it bends toward justice. Um, I think David Seib would say the same thing. I would think he would say uh, um, the arc of environment is, takes a long, it doesn't always work, there are good days and bad days, but on balance, it, it, it bends toward achievement. On balance, it bends toward success. Um, but we have to be there. Uh, we have to carry his legacy. Uh, we have to be uh, advancing groups, advancing citizens. We have to be training. We have to be advocating. We have to be talking about that. We have to care deeply. We have to tell our kids. We have to tell our friends. These are important. Uh, 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 climate issues are important. You're important. The water you drink, the air you breathe. Those are the kind of legacies that David passed on to us, and we want to pass on uh, to our kids as well. Great fun for me uh, to talk to you. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll take them. So let's see, what I didn't tell you. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah sure, I, uh, yes, Volkswagen's on our mind, but I'm not gonna talk about it, but what, please. Pretty, it's pretty interesting. There's two international uh, groups. One handle our border between Canada uh, and the United States. The other one handles actually uh, the border between the United States and Mexico. There's two international groups, and, and those groups actually have uh, both uh, uh, countries uh, involved, and they have different uh, 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 rules associated with actually how you actually handle uh, uh, disputes. We've been involved in two different ways. Uh, in, in Canada, we were involved uh, uh, because uh, of a smelting operation in BC. Uh, British Columbia that uh, uh, we allege and faculty had flowed downstream and was affecting uh, adversely, uh, among other places, the Coeur d'Alene Lake in Idaho. Uh, and so uh, EPA brought an action. Uh, that's, uh, they settled that action uh, in order for the company, not, not Canada itself, but for the company, in fact, uh, uh, to go through the study process to ultimately clean that up. At the same time, in a case that we're not involved in directly, uh, uh, tribes, uh, uh, brought an action because it was affecting part of Coeur d'Alene is actually uh, the Coeur d'Alene tribe uh, 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 there. They won in the district court. Uh, that court has been appealed to the Ninth Circuit uh, on that law. Canada has filed a lawsuit, has filed their own brief on behalf of their, their own company. We have filed uh, uh, a brief on behalf of the tribe, but that's not resolved yet because part of the question is, uh, uh, should that be handled in litigation or should that be handled in one of their uh, administrative tribunals that, uh, uh, that came into effect by these treaties? Mexico, we had the almost the opposite uh, 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 issue because there was Mexico sewage from Tijuana coming onto the beaches of San Diego uh, 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 there. Ultimately, that required legislation uh, uh, there, legislation that actually creates now uh, a wastewater treatment plant solely for that issue, solely to handle that waste stream that was coming out of uh, 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 Tijuana. I, I know that sounds crazy, it's, it looks like the water's flowing north, but that's how it works uh, uh, there from Tijuana to, uh, uh, it actually goes almost as far as Santa Barbara, so it's, it's a huge uh, uh, area. Um, in terms of what Montreal is doing, I don't know, uh, but those are two examples of cases that we've been involved in. Please. Here at Columbia. Oh, good. Okay. Um, oh, here I can turn this on. Um, so I, I hope you're inspired by all the law students are here who are doing good things. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Um, and so I wanted to ask about the Keystone Pipeline and Justice's involvement in that. So from what I understand, quite a while ago, um, State hired this group ERM to review the pipeline's impact on climate. And then this whole controversy arose because ERM <coughs> had also done work directly for the tar sands industry. And I think State had some sort of internal report that later found that there was no wrongdoing. But I was wondering if Department of Justice So pipeline uh, is involved. actually quite interesting because uh, uh, you might ask the question, why State Department? Uh, this is a pipeline. O ordinarily, the pipeline permitting is State Department has no role in. This is all done by Environmental Protection Agency. They're making those sorts of decisions. And we've represented EPA in countless sort of permit fights. Uh, and so why would State Department have this one? Because it's international. Uh, so the, it's the international aspects that give that. And there's a whole process uh, uh, that you go through uh, uh, because it is, in fact, uh, a uh, ultimate state decision. And this was, you know, there's been environmental impact statements. Those have gone public. Uh, uh, no decision. There is no decision yet that has been made. When there is a decision, assuming that maybe there would be litigation out of that, uh, uh, then, uh, then we would represent uh, uh, the State Department in that case. But it hasn't happened yet uh, uh, there. We actually take the position uh, that if you're making a presidential decision, that a presidential decision is not reviewable. Uh, uh, there, the Administrative Procedure Act, which is how you actually review these things, uh, uh, governs agencies, not the president. Uh, we say the same thing under uh, decisions that are made by the president uh, that could be affected by the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, uh, and we filed those sorts of things in other cases, uh, and, and it's relevant uh, uh, ultimately here too, uh, but no decision has been made. So we're not, you know, we're just waiting like the rest of the public to see uh, uh, what's going to happen. But when it does, if there is a, uh, but, it, but actually, again, there are international tribunals that affect all these things too. So, so it's possible uh, that it would not go to court, that it would go to some international tribunal as opposed to court. Uh, but that would be our responsibility if it goes to federal court uh, out there. Others? Please. I think we have time for one more question, and then we will need to wrap it up. Please. So I would be in danger if I start talking about uh, environmental policy, particularly this one, biomass, which has both Department of Agriculture, one of my major clients, and EPA uh, uh, there. We have done biomass litigation because, in fact, uh, it's been challenged. Uh, uh, some of the decisions by EPA have been challenged in that regard. Uh, uh, people saying you're doing too much, people saying you're do doing too little uh, uh, there. Biomass is, a, you know, is a, another alternative energy uh, 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 platform. Uh, if you will, uh, but it has a lot of impact on agricultural issues, a lot of impact on agricultural issues. And there's a lot written right now about uh, does that really help on energy because you're, you're actually using a lot of energy in its creation. Having said that, I will not jump into uh, the policy debate uh, uh, because I would be not only over my head, but all my clients would dislike me if I did that. John, I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. <laughs>